Well, thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, as uh, we are all care, our mission is about making the, the world a better place and trying to understand how countries grow out of poverty. So I'm going to share with you some of the insights we got from trying to get with all the research that Frank and Ricardo has been doing for a while, explaining what makes country grow faster. Uh, what have we learned from applying those into concrete uh, policy cases and countries we have been working with? As they have documented widely, it's uh, the diversification implies learning to do something new. You got to learn to do something you don't know how to do. And as they have documented, it's easier to bring people that know how to do that. It's easier to move brains into countries than actually to move knowledge into brains. So diversification often entails and comes accompanied by a large uh, proportion of immigrants. Immigrants explain a lot of how countries diversify. So the policy prescription then is obvious. We need to bring more people. And that's easy. And then that is where we stumble with, with the sense of us that makes that process difficult. So we do a lot of projects. We had stumbled into this in many of them. I'm just going to share with you three, three stories, three countries we've worked with, and the lessons we've learned on the sense of us. The first country is Panama. Panama, it's a country that has grown very rapidly over the previous decade. As you can see there, they grew at an average rate of 8% for 10 years. Uh, they duplicated their income per capita. And a very special uh, feature that makes uh, Panama special, it's the fact that they have done this based on the service sector. So the product space Fran showed and the investi investigation and research we've done, it's based on goods because the information on goods is widely available. When you check Panama, the exports of goods per capita actually estagnated and it's one of the lowest in the world and the, by far the lowest in Latin America. But the exports of good have multiplied by eight in a period of 15 years and puts Panama at the head of Latin America in exports of service per capita, very close to OECD economies. And that makes of Panama a very special case because these services are exportable. So they allow Panamanians to purchase goods from the rest of the world that they don't produce. The, the, the key feature about Panama is that this service sector requires uh, it's a high skill intensive sector. So it does require a lot of specialized labor that was not present in Panama before this started. And the Panamanian system, as a sort of a bad uh, second best, does not produce uh, these professionals. Actually, the last time Panama took the PISA test, they came out the last in Latin America in science, math, and reading. But the fact is, if you look at the green lines, are the services that Panama is expanding into. And the percentage of workers with college diplomas in those sectors, it's very high. So if you need to learn to do things that you don't know how to do and your educational system is not producing those skills, how did you manage to do that? So Panama managed to do it attracting a lot of foreigners. They did a strategy based on two pillars. One pillar is we, they created in 2007 a law called the Headquarters Law, that in the streets of Panama it's called the Procter & Gamble Law because it was tailor-made to attract the headquarters of Procter & Gamble to Panama. And under that umbrella, more than 120 headquarters have moved from the rest of Latin America, a lot of them from Venezuela, to Panama, and have brought with them a, a wide array of specialities and expats that are working in the Panamanian economy now and provide those skills. The second pillar of that strategy was the special economic zones. Panama took a former military base of the US in Clayton and turned that into a technology park, uh, which is called Ciudad El Saber, or City of Knowledge, and they host today there a little bit less than 100 companies that thrive on innovation and research. And they also created an industrial park where they offer plenty of advantages, fiscal, uh, special labor provisions for the companies there, expedient bureaucracy within that area that is hosting more than 300 companies. So that was their strategy and that was the way they managed. The interesting thing is that Panama, as Ricardo likes to say, and he's a Venezuelan saying, killed the tiger and then became afraid of the skin. So you bring all these immigrants and then you 
you have a regulation that curtails them, that minimizes the technology spillovers that derive from their participation in the Panamanian economy. So you do have a lot of restrictions to immigrants, like 27 occupations are restricted to Panamanians. That includes all the engineers, chemists, and also educators. Like, as much as Ricardo likes to say that he's a universal guy that has taught all over the world, he cannot teach in a Panamanian university. Then there's a list of 50 countries that are considered national security concerns, that if you apply for a Panamanian visa in these countries, you are expected to wait a period of a year or two years because they are subject to a process called authorized visas. And these countries include most of Africa, a large chunk of Asia, including India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and some European, Eastern European countries that are part of us, like Albania. And at last, as Ricardo mentioned yesterday, they have a cap of 10% to the number of foreigners you can have the payroll. So these restrictions are on the people thinking coming into Panama. But on the people already in Panama, there are a number of restrictions that guarantee that the knowledge they bring is going to be locked into the gates of multinational companies or special economic zones. So all the years you spend at a company in Panama do not count for residence purposes. Your dependents are not allowed to work. So they have these people already there, but they're not using them. Uh, visas are revoked the moment you decide to quit the multinational company that brought you into Panama. So if you want to leave your company and put up a business, you cannot do that because you are left in a sort of legal limbo from which a few lawyers' offices benefit a lot. But not everyone can pay for that. And at last, we have a technology park that needs to be innovating all the time. But the moment you want to move from innovation to selling the products of that innovation, you are left without a visa status. You, are, you can be expelled because you are not innovating more, and then you have no visa to sell that within to Panama. So this uh, area really works for companies like GlaxoSmithKline, which we visited, that develops products there that they in turn sell in the rest of the world, but not in Panama. So this, all these restrictions are, you brought all these foreigners, and then you are building these walls that keep the knowledge sort of gate within special economic zones. We tested what are the most binding restrictions to Panama growing further, and what we found, it's talent. These are the premiums earned by foreigners in Panama, but in all industries and in all occupations. And as Ricardo always reminds us, this line here is not zero. It's 50%, it's the average. So that means that you pick a Panamanian worker and a foreign expat of the same education, same experience, within the same industry, on the same occupation, and the foreigner earns, on average, 50% more than the Panamanian. And for the occupations that Panama is trying to expand into, like transport, storage, uh, wholesale trade, the premiums can go as high as 70 to 80%. So Panama is paying dearly for these guys. And they want to reduce this gap. But the strategy to reduce this gap is allowing more to come in, not less. If you allow less and you want to keep it growing, the companies are going to fight for these guys. And the premiums are going to go very high. So they also, at the same time, have a strategy of every four or five years organize something called Crisol of Razas, where they give a legal status to a lot of unskilled workers that migrated illegally to Panama. So they had actually built a machine of inequality. Because you make a workers scarce at the top level, so they earn every time more. But then you allow in all these uh, low-skilled workers that came to Panama illegally, so you bring those salary down. And that's part of the explanation of why Panama keeps on being one of the most unequal countries in the world, in spite of having reduced inequality significantly over the previous 10 years. We have also shown that in those industries where the share of immigrants is higher, Panamanian workers make better. So, and that is particularly true for low-skilled Panamanians. So if you increase the percentage of foreigners in the industry district where a Panamanian worker is by 10%, the sal this is associated to an increase of 11% on average in the salary of low-skilled Panamanians. So restricting the immigration of high-skilled workers will not help the Panamanians, all to the contrary. But then there's this feeling in Panama that we are full of foreigners. I mean, you guys want to bring more foreigners. We are already fed up. We want to be like Singapore. 
Yes, if you want to be like Singapore, like Singapore has 45% of foreigners in the workforce. Panama has that divided by 10, 4.5, 4.7. So they want to be like Singapore and Hong Kong, which are also economies based on a strong service sector. But they are unwilling to bring and tolerate and include into the wider, wider national definition of who we are, these foreigners. So that's the, first, that's the first story. One country you see here well placed is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has a lot of foreigners. So by looking at Saudi Arabia there, you may have thought, man, they should be doing great. They should be diversifying a lot because they are indeed allowing all these foreigners to come in. So in Saudi Arabia, it's interesting because 83% of the workforce in the private sector are foreigners. 83%. That's a massive amount. Only 17 are Saudis. So I asked the Saudi team how this happened. Where are the other Saudis? And they told me, well, and the government. All the other Saudis you didn't see here work in the Saudi government. And contrary to Panama, immigrants make a lot less than Saudis. A lot less means like uh, the Saudis make 225% more than the immigrants. We suspect that maybe, not sure, that has something to do with the minimum salary in Saudi Arabia. Here we just charted the economic complexity index, which is this index of how much things you produce and which other countries are able to produce that, that Frank just explained. We draft that against the minimum wage in the country in constant US dollars. So you see Saudi Arabia here running very high that means that Saudi Arabian companies have to compete with uh, countries that have the level of salary like Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, but they are not even close to have that level of complexity. So when you see this chart, you might wonder, well, is it that foreigners are taking the jobs out of the Saudis because the Saudis are forced to earn this very high minimum salary uh, foreigners not, so I hire them and I fire the Saudis, so the foreigners are stealing our jobs. So what we've come to see, and this work has been led by Juan Obach, and I think Lyubitsa is going to present a little bit of, of this more earlier. Again, this issue of complementarity that it's very important for us that Frank was mentioning, we, what we have found is that if you increase the percentage of foreigners in a firm in Saudi Arabia, that is associated with an increase in the salaries of the Saudis working there. And then you think, well, obviously, because you just bring uh, new cheap guys and you fire the others. No, we have checked on the probability of a Saudi losing it, his or her job in a firm. Given that the foreigners came in, and it's not significantly different from zero. So immigrants in Saudi are complements to the Saudis, as they are in Panama. They are not substitutes. So there, there is a policy that is based on the idea that they are substitutes. That is, we have to restrict those guys. I mean, if you bring a foreigner, uh, he cannot own a business here in Riyadh or elsewhere in Saudi Arabia. We will not give him a path to residency, no matter how many years he spends here. He cannot own land. He's going to have a hard time having his uh, dependents to work in Saudi. And he cannot move to another business without, without an authorization for the firm he's working in. And when oil prices came down, on top of that, the Saudis thought, well, let's increase the tax we charge on foreigner wages to get uh, public revenue. So with this, they're threatening to destroy the few profitability left in, in whatever that is not oil that Saudi might be producing. So when you look at the average spell that these conditions produce in foreigners, a foreigner into Saudi Arabia, if it's a, a woman, it spends on average 21 months in her work, and a male, 23. So that is less than two years. So you put all these advertisements in the world, newspapers, we need nurses to Saudi Arabia, we need contractors, engineers, we need people to go into the oil business that has been certified by Aramco, and we even need people for a five-star hotel we're putting there. You put all these advertisements, you attract all these people, but then you have a provisions that make these people stay in the country for a very short spell. 
And part of the story of lack of diversification in Saudi Arabia obviously has to do with the Dutch disease and the fact that this very high minimum salary renders almost anything other than natural resources uncompetitive. That's true, but it's also the fact that all the knowledge that comes with these immigrants cannot really be assimilated and spread over the economy in a period of 23 months. It's like trying to run an organization uh, with people that it's leaving uh, every two years. So it's, it's very hard. So that's the story, story of Saudi Arabia. The last story I want to tell is the story of Chiapas. Because Chiapas, it's really the quintessential sense of us issue that we have found in all of our projects. First of all, the country, it's been broken in half. The, the, the state has been broken in half. And half of the country, like the eastern side of the country, it's occupied by five different tribes with five different origins that speak five different languages and doesn't relate much to each other. Someone said here yesterday that the sense of us has to do with the conscience you have of what percentage of the things you are consuming are produced by somebody else. Well, these are almost subsistence agricultural communities that relate very little with the outside world. And this, in these places, there's something called uso y costumbres, which is the law that prevails there that renders all the property communal in these colored areas. So it's very difficult for a private business to come in and settle there because you're going to have a lot of trouble finding land to establish yourself. And then you might have some trouble by Indians blocking the roads because they don't want you to advance faster than them. There are strong barriers to migrants in these Indian communities. First, the property your family has, it's communal. That means if you decide to move, the opportunity cost is zero. You don't get any money for that, and then you move to a urban environment where you have to pay rent. And then you lose the social benefits of being in these Indian communities of Chiapas. So this proposal, it's very tough for them, so no one migrates. But on top of that, there is something very interesting we found out on our last trip to Chiapas is that these communities have a tax on migrants. So when you leave from one of these Indian communities to the United States, your fam you are called to a service community. You, you need to do some service in the community. If you're not there, you need to pay the fine or your family needs to pay a fine. That on average is $2,000. So one day we were there. These are the local authorities of the municipality. They appointed a team of 10 people to deal with the problem with the water in the community, which is called the Water Commission. Nine of them weren't there. Now, I was surprised, like, how come nine of them are not there? I said, well, because those nine are migrants. They are in the United States. So they picked them in a way that their family has to pay. If their family doesn't pay, they can take away the land from there. So you can only be called to service community every four years. So the average spell of these guys abroad is six to seven years. So they work abroad. They work the like, first time they pay the fine. And then when they're about to pay the fine for the second time, they return. So there are a lot of return migrants in these, uh, in these Indian communities. The few of them that go, because Chiapas has a very low migration rate, an extremely low. When you look at how Mexican moves from their states of origin within Mexico, and how Chiapas, Chapanecos move away from Chiapas, their likelihood to migrate is one third because of these cultural restrictions. Interestingly, interestingly, the few that manage to migrate make a lot of money identically to any other Mexican migrating. If we call a Mexican worker on average 100, when he migrates to other states, he gets a premium of 15 in his salary, and in total, he gets 115. Well, uh, in Chiapas, you make, with respect to this 100, 33% less. But if a, a guy from Chiapas migrates, and we track them down in the census, he arrives at the place and makes a premium of 51. So on average, this difference, it's statistically insignificant. That means that the Chapanecos are not the problem. These guys are all fine. I mean, if they leave Chiapas and they mix their letters with more complex letters elsewhere in Mexico, they do great. So education has been a strong focus on the government over the previous uh, two decades and a half after the Zapatista uprisal. Education is not explaining the gap today. Because if they leave Chiapas, they insert themselves very well somewhere else. There are other barriers to, uh, to Indian communities integrating. If you check the, the border communities, those Indian communities that are close to urban centers, 
Mexico has made a great investment in infrastructure. So there are great roads, great highways, but there's no public transportation. So these guys of the community of Cruston in San Juan Chamula live 15 minutes away from San Cristobal de las Casas, which is one of the largest urban centers in Chiapas. But there's no public transportation. So they need to grab a private taxi that they share, and they spend going and return 20 pesos daily. So I took the daily wage they will make in the city and subtracted the 40 pesos they have to pay in private transportation. And as you can see, this is only worth for people on the higher end of the spectrum of wages, like director of a school, a teacher of a school. But if you're a launderer, uh, albañil, ¿cómo se dice? construction worker, you're a helper of a construction worker, electricist, this transport cost becomes like a tax that you don't want to pay and prevents you from bringing your letters to the urban center of Chiapas where there's a complex economy where you could potentially be more productive. And at the same time, it delays the learning process because these people with transportation could go into the city, get to work, and get better at what they do. But because this is so high, they don't do that. So there are cultural barriers, there are language barriers, there are transport barriers, and then there's this thing we did in Chiapas, which was asking in people, uh, people in a community, tell me three people in this community you would do business with. And they mentioned three. And we did that to 201 persons in the community of Cruston. And then we charged that into a network. And as you can see there, there's not like a single reference guy that everybody wants to do business with. No, everybody wants to do business with the three guys of his family that are around. So the network is very spread. The person named the most, I think Michele identified it somewhere here, was named three times. You ask 200 people in a town of 1,500, name three people you will work with or put a business with, and the guy most mentioned was mentioned three times. So this will make cooperatives and this kind of get people together business, the type of thing Gustavo Grobocopatel does, very unlikely, because the sense of us in this Indian community is us as the family. So you have like the family us. Then you have like the Indian communities us, which makes things extremely difficult. So when we put the, up the product space, which was that thing that uh, very sophisticated that Frank just explained earlier, which is these are all the goods that can be manufactured in the world. And you have colors in all the goods that Chiapas, it's competitive. You see here, this is cassava, this is bananas, if there are fruits, but then there's a guy there in the middle. There's a monkey, like Ricardo likes to say, there's a monkey there that in spite of not having any other of its familiar sectors in terms of technology around, it's surviving. So we pointed to that guy. Who's that guy? It's a, it's a guy that manufactures harnesses, harnesses for cars. So we went there, not hard to identify, it's only one in Chiapas, it's called Yasaki. So Yasaki, it's a company that was brought into Chiapas by Ernesto Cedillo in 1994, making this huge effort of looking for a company that was labor intensive. There's plenty of educated labor in Chiapas, and asked them, what do you need to come to Chiapas? And in the end, the government gave them a financing to acquire land, not ejidos, but right in Tuxtla Gutierrez, the capital. And then the government subsidized the training periods for workers that last six days. And after six days, they are able to join this very complex production line that is right at the center of Tuxtla Gutierrez. So they started here. This is a map of Chiapas. If you remember, this is sort of the axis that marks the Indian territories from the non-Indian or non-Ejido properties. They put, they put themselves here, and then they started moving around. They put a second plant, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and then they are planning two more for a total of seven. So the way they expanded is extremely informative. They are expanding into first section where you can buy property. So these are not the Indian communities, but these are very close to the Indian communities. 
because there is lots of labor. In cities like Tapachula and Tuxla Gutierrez, the unemployment rate is two to three percent. So these cities are already full and there's no more labor. If you want to bring labor, you have to offer a higher salary. So they decided to move the plant away, put it in the borders, and each of these plants has a own Yasaki transport system of 30 kilometers around to bring the workers to the plants. So they have expanded in a way that it's a mirror of the very tough challenges that the region has. So that's more or less the stories we wanted to tell. So some thoughts to conclude. I didn't want to call these conclusions because I've talked to Ricardo yesterday and I felt like, man, we didn't have any real conclusion because this sense of us thing, it's a very, very tough thing. First, what we conclude for this is like immigrants are soccer referees. Like when things are going extremely well, you don't notice. Uh, who was a referee on, on that game? Well, you don't notice. But if they do badly, then you have something very easy to identify because they were in black or in yellow and signal them, hey, that's the guy, that was the guilty one. So there's an asymmetry to immigrants that when they do good to the economy, they don't show up and no one talks about them. But when the economy is going down, it's a very easy scapegoat to identify. The second thing is that Ricardo was telling me, yesterday we talked and said, well, okay, how do we address this? This is a leadership challenge. He was telling me, no, no, this is not a leadership challenge because this is not a policy. The sense of us, it's a feeling. And because it's a feeling, it's very, very hard to change. Uh, it's like, like this book of the, the Jonathan Hyde, The Righteous Self. Like you see things and immediately you know. You see immigrants when things are going badly and you say, this guy, it's a problem. And no one will convince you of the opposite if you have or live in a community that has a definition of self that somehow excludes foreigners. It's like picking a Real Madrid fan and showing him the technology of the game yesterday that Cristiano Ronaldo was offside in two goals. <laughs> but if the guy is a Real Madrid guy, his line in his mind will be this. So he wasn't really in offside. Even though you have the technology, you show it to him very concretely, man, he was offside. A Real Madrid fan will not see that. So this sense of us, it's a feeling, and it's very hard to overcome. Like for me, I'm a Barca fan. To write this morning, we here, was very, very difficult. Like I have, they just see what they want to see. And I said, well, the sense of us, it's us, probably I do the same when I watch Barca games. It was very tough to come up with this we here, which is only an indicator of how hard it was for me. Well, at last, uh, what I have just told you is that places have ways to define their sense of us. And that sense of us, according to all the work we've done and we've stumbled in, it's key to the possibilities of that place of developing and growing out of poverty. So even though this is a tough topic, even though we don't know how to deal with this. Yesterday we heard explanation, this is a genetical thing. This is a thing you learn since you're very small. This is something you grow up with. This is a feeling. This is not something you think about. It's something that you feel. Well, those things are very tough to change. So we're not sure how to deal with this. But because we, we are concerned about making the world a better place and helping places to grow faster and grow out of poverty, we felt that we really needed to point this out because we understand that this sense of us, it's an essential component of that and our mission. Thank you very much.